researchers tell us that if we could be a fly on the wall at uh, someone's home, that we might hear a lot of couples using uh, baby talk with each other. I don't know if y'all do that or not, but uh, <clears throat> so, and some of those same uh, psychologists tell us that uh, this is kind of a sign of a healthy relationship. And so, you know, I don't, you know, you know something you might want to try, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, you're the, you're the hot sauce on my taco or something like that, you know, that's a good one. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so baby talk is something that researchers say is a sign of a healthy relationship. Uh, here in the South, we use the term uh, dear and, and sweetheart and baby and uh, probably the most common word is honey especially in the South. And so those are terms of affection and endearment. And sometimes uh, we, we're not that good at baby talk, you know. Uh, you know, probably, hey, you is not a good, uh, good way to start a conversation with your loved one. You know, especially if it's followed by bring me a beer or something like that, you know. You, it's just not a good way to do things. But uh, <clears throat> to use baby talk as, at least according to the psychologist, is a sign of a healthy relationship. Now, of course, the fact if you do not use baby talk when you talk with your spouse, it does not necessarily mean that you do not have a healthy relationship. There are other ways to express your emotions and your love for each other, and so you're okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, so, Mark, you, you're, you're off the hook there, okay? Uh, but... <clears throat> But at the same time today, that scene, you know, you may, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, really our text today uh, is really about baby talk. That's what Paul said he had to use when it comes to speaking to the brothers and sisters at the Corinthian church. Uh, but the mood is a little bit different here. It's not a, uh, a romantic or a uh, really even a, a good mood that he's having to do this. Uh, Paul isn't really into baby talk, but he's having to do that because of their immaturity. And he said that he's heard about the jealousy and quarreling. And he says in the, in the book there, uh, now I appeal to you brothers and sisters. He says, uh, I appeal to you brothers and sisters by the name of the uh, Lord Jesus Christ that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it's been reported to me that there are quarrels among you. So following up on that in, in the reading, Paul says that he can't speak to them as a spiritual people. I have to talk to you as children because you cannot understand when I'm talking to you as an adult. That's kind of an indictment on the church at Corinth. I can't speak to you as spiritual people. You see, it's normal, as Samantha was talking about this morning, for a young Christian to begin with milk. It's normal for a baby to begin with milk and baby food. But there comes a point when we move from baby food to solid food, maybe pizza, if you will. But the problem is that there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians who have never moved beyond that point of the infant lifestyle and maturity. That they still have a need to be spoon fed or a need to be given a baby food because they've never developed past the very, very simple things of the faith. You see, there's some basic things that we believe when we become a Christian, but we move on to other things after we've been saved for a while, and we begin to read and we begin to learn some things. And so, Paul's not really into baby talk, but he's going, got some points here that he wants to make. And the first point is this, if you're writing this down. Number one, time does not always lead to spiritual maturity. Time does not always lead to spiritual maturity. It doesn't matter how old you are. You may be the oldest person in the church and be the most immature person 
in the church. It doesn't matter how much time you've been a Christian necessarily. You should be, but not always. Look what he says in chapter 3, verse 1. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, <clears throat> as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you're still not ready. You may have grown up in the church, but that doesn't mean you've grown up. You see, um, think about the Corinthian church here. The Apostle Paul was the one who probably founded this church. And so he has kind of a right, and he understands a little bit of what, about what's going on here. He founded the church, according to historians, uh, probably around the year A.D. 50. It was uh, on his second missionary journey. So toward the end of that second missionary journey, he founded this church of Corinth. When he wrote this letter to them, this was when he was in Ephesus, and that is around A.D. 55. Which means that it had been at least five years since the church was founded. Five years for them to learn, to grow, to hear sermons, to go to Bible study, to partake of communion, to read the Word and share together. Five years. And in five years Paul is saying that they had not grown in any kind of maturity. In five years they had not developed. We've all seen those children that uh, stay on baby food uh, way too long when they're much, much older than they should have moved on. And that's what's happening here. Paul said, in the time since you began, you should have developed, you should have moved on. You should be more spiritually mature than you are. And they hadn't reached that point. No wonder the writer from Hebrews 6 seems to scream out in chapter 6 verse 1, Therefore, let us go on toward perfection. Leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ <clears throat> and not laying again the foundation. And what he's saying there, don't get caught up on that word perfection as some have done. Let us go on to perfection simply means maturity. Just substitute the word maturity there. Let us go on into maturity. Leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ and not laying again the foundation. Uh, in other words, by now you should go on into other things. I have, uh, <clears throat> I grew up in, in, in an area where uh, <clears throat> We heard the same thing every Sunday, it seemed like. And it was almost always a sermon, sort of a, a sinner sermon. And every Sunday we would hear basically the same, some of the same phrases, and some of the same things that we heard every week. I remember, uh, I remember one preacher that we, we, when I was younger we, we used to go to the church a lot and uh, he preached a lot on Zacchaeus for some reason. That was his favorite subject. And so Zacchaeus, you know, went up in the tree and, uh, to look at the Lord and all that. Well, uh, my granny was not known to have any filters, really. She pretty much spoke her mind. Uh, my granny on my mom's side. And granny Reese, one time, I remember uh, them telling a story. That she said, you've had Zacchaeus up in that tree, up and down that tree so much, you've done more of the bark off that tree. <laughs> and so, I, it, it is sometimes, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. I remember uh, going <clears throat> to uh, revival services to one preacher that, that I enjoyed when I was uh, just a young man. 19, 20 years old. And this was uh, when I was getting ready to preach or just actually starting out to preach and I would write down sermons or their outlines and stuff because I thought well I might want to use them. Uh, he had a pretty good outline I thought I'm going to write that down. Kind of like Sarah does. You know she can remember sermons that I can't remember. You know uh, she, she has that ability to do that. And so 
I wrote it down, and I probably preached it several times in revivals myself as a, in my 20s. But about 35 years later, I went back to this guy's church where he was pastoring and listened to him preach. And you know he preached that exact same sermon, the same exact outlines. I mean, nothing changed whatsoever. And I don't know, maybe he just... Out of uh, coincidence, he just happened to preach that again, and maybe hadn't preached it for 30 years, but it was just, I just thought it was interesting that he did that. And so, you can see how it would be hard to develop in any kind of spiritual maturity if every week you hear the same kind of sermons that are more foundational sermons. Just kind of, uh, and I'm not trying to put anyone down today, I'm saying it's hard to grow when you don't get anything but the basics all of, every Sunday week after week. However, that's not really the problem here. That's not what's going on here because they had Paul and they had Apollos and they had some great preachers. So I don't think the preachers was the problem. Sometimes in churches, uh, when you see this a lot, that you see churches change pastors a lot, there's something going on. And it seems like every time there's a problem, they want to get rid of the pastor. And they go after one pastor, another pastor, and another pastor, and they always try to put the blame there. Well, maybe the pastor's not the problem. And in this case, it wasn't the problem. I remember one time uh, I shared a story with the congregation uh, that had to do with uh, maybe the problem is not you, uh, uh, that it is you, it's not someone else, but maybe the problem is you. I got a phone call that night from a very angry husband who said, you meant that for my wife. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I really didn't. And, and in fact, I didn't even know his wife was guilty of it, but I, did, I do now. But anyway, I think it's just, the, 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 it's interesting to me that a church like Corinth could have such great preachers and still not develop. So what is the problem? The problem is not with the preaching. The problem is, you know, Jesus said, he that hath ears, let him hear. Sometimes we can come to church and we can, we can, we can come Wednesday, mor uh, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and all those times, and still not really grow. Because in order for it to grow, we have to accept it, and we have to digest it, and we have to uh, be willing to change. And so, uh, point number two is this. Our behavior often reflects our spiritual maturity. Our behavior often reflects our spiritual maturity. You see that in verses 3 and 4 when he talks about the, the division and the things that were going on and, and how that they were proving by their behavior their spiritual immaturity. And you know, we can say, well, I'm the most mature Christian there is, but if our behavior is not showing that, then it speaks more loudly. The Corinthians were divided over which preacher they preferred to listen to. Paul points out the work that both he and Apollos had done. And he says this, that, that he had planted and Apollos had watered. And you guys that do this all the time know more about this than even I do. But I know enough to know that it takes someone to plant the seed Someone to water it, cultivate it, and then let it grow. And he says that he had planted and Apollos had watered. And I think he meant that in the sense that Paul had planted the church. He had actually founded the church. I planted it. I came and I started this church. We, even today we call them church plants when we start up a new church. So, Apollos came along later and preached and, and helped develop what Paul had already started. So, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. God gave the growth. And Paul says, neither he that is, uh, it's not important who plants or waters, but that God gives growth. Because you know this, Matt, as well as anybody here, is that if you can do all the things the right way, you can plant and you can water and you can do all those, but unless the miracle of growth happens, unless God does the miracle of growth, it won't grow. It'll die. Every plant will die. And so, Paul was saying that in the end, 
what, if it grows or not is out of our hands. We're just laborers in the field. Psychologist and priest Eugene Kennedy says that there's a little boy in the biggest man. And we could change that and say a little boy or a little girl in the biggest person. And he says that he is forever trying to get out. And you know, there's not a problem with having that child inside of us. We all have that child inside of us. And that's wonderful. As you know, these children up here are filled with such wonder. And it's a beautiful thing to watch a child and the excitement of life and the enthusiasm and the inquisitive mind. And we all want to have those things. But at the same time, there's another child that he talks about, and that is in some of us, that has never grown up. And that's the obstinate, the stubborn child who always wants to have his or her way, who always refuses to see things anybody else's way. And that is spiritual immaturity, really. And so, someone has given us some, uh, some s symptoms. And I think Paul and, and what Paul and Dr. Kennedy were talking about uh, can be described as emotional immaturity. And there's some overlap between. It's kind of like the boy that fell out of bed one night. He said, uh, you know, he, he fell out of bed. And his mom heard a noise come upstairs and, and saw him getting back into bed. And she said, what happened? And he said, I don't know. I guess I just, uh, he said, I just got too close to where I got in. You know, I stayed too close to where I got in. And I think the same thing can be true <clears throat> of us spiritually, is that we can remain too close to the foundational and the spiritual things of where we started that we never develop and we never grow. Um, and so, in terms of our faith, here's some symptoms of spiritual immaturity. First of all, holding the belief that faith will make you prosper or at least protect you from great troubles. What's wrong with that? I deal with this all the time. And I have to tell you, it's a very hard thing to deal with. For those people who believe that because they have great faith, that they're always going to prosper and that they won't have problems. And this is a very tough thing to deal with as a chaplain. And I never want to take away anyone's hope from them. Ever. Because... God, if God is in, God always gives us hope. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we don't have problems. It doesn't mean that we're always going to prosper in the way we'd like to. Second one is thinking of prayer as a shopping list of requests. Always about us. Struggling with the same weakness with no success. What an earlier generation of Christians called besetting sins. Expecting ongoing spiritual highs. Hanging your faith on a human leader, sign of immaturity. Believing that the main reason for going to church is for what you receive, or what you get out of it. Having the blinding certainty that your understanding of faith is right, and therefore anyone who sees faith differently must be wrong. Well, here's some symptoms of spiritual growth, of uh, spiritual growth. It includes understanding that faith is neither, neither a guarantee or prosperity of prosperity nor protection from troubles, but a certain knowledge that God is with you. Amen. Using prayer as a way to make yourself vulnerable to God. Having more success in the struggle with besetting sins, but also a greater understanding that salvation is not something you earn. It's a gift of God. Hanging your faith on Christ despite how human leaders serve Him or fail Him. Or fail to serve Him. Realizing that going to church is both for what you receive and what you give. Grasping that others' understanding of faith doesn't have to be wrong. For yours to be God's truth for you. Now I could spend all day on each of these points. And we don't have time to do that. But I think they're very good uh, for us to understand that there are some signs of spiritual maturity. And Paul is not only uh, the only church leader who ever needed to address the problem 
of getting stuck in a spiritual rut or just staying where you are. The writer to the epistle to Hebrews said something similar to his readers. In Hebrews 5 he says, You have come to the place where you need milk instead of solid food. Everyone who lives on milk is not used to the word of righteousness, but they are babies. But solid food is for the mature. The last point. This is the challenge. Let's grow together. He ends this section on a positive note. For we are God's servants working together. Growing together. And it takes a team to grow together. And in every church people are at different levels. And one thing I want you to hear today, I don't want you to leave this place thinking, you know what, the pastor thinks I'm a baby. Okay? You might be, but you know, that's not what I'm saying today. And the problem with the Corinthian church that there were a lot of babies and most of them were not in the nursery, you know. But here's what I want you to understand, that in every church there's people on different levels of maturity, spiritually speaking. Some are infants, and they need more coddling, and they need more uh, attention, and they need more help from the older people to guide them along. That's good. That's okay. But at the same time, we need to move on to maturity and to perfection. We need to grow, and we need to grow together. And that's why it's so important for us to be involved in small groups such as Sunday school or Wednesday night and those things. It's important for us to be a part of a church where we hear sermons where hopefully we can grow that will inspire us and challenge us to read more and to grow in the Christ. We have a responsibility to help our young ones, our infants, to grow up, not just uh, the babies in our nursery, as I said, but our young Christians to grow up in the Lord. We are their example. They're looking up to us. And sometimes, sometimes we may think, well, you know, I could never be a Christian like that person. I could never pray like this person, like Mark, or I could never uh, preach like this, so I could never sing like this person. But here's the thing we're all in this together. And it's not a contest. It's not about who does the best job. It's not about who sounds the best. It's about us putting our gifts together and growing in the Lord. And as Christians we support one another and we encourage one another. And when it's time we pat one another on the back. And other times we cry with one another. That's what the church does. We're a family. But we're growing together. And we have to do that by just trusting the Lord. Let's pray as the musicians come. Father, thank You. Thank You for this reminder of our need to develop our spiritual maturity. And thank You, God, that we have people around us that are mature in, in Christ that can help lead us in we can follow their example, Lord. And in those times, Lord, where they're not following Christ, that we, we know that too. So I pray for each and every person here today. God, I pray your will be done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.